Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? Full Auto Friday number 30, which I guess could have been a mag dump or something special, but, well, actually, it was something special. I had two friends in town, Evan Hafer and Trevor Thompson, who will also be featured on Monday's episode. Now, I don't know what the hell is going on in the studio, but for the first time ever, all three of the cards from the video cameras were corrupted. So if you're a YouTube fan, I'm sorry to tell you, you're just going to look at a picture of us, three handsome devils. Because essentially, the audio is the only thing that survived. I don't know. The uh, video and audio from the episode on Monday, it's all perfect. I I have no idea. So the learning continues, but, you know, I guess that's the way that it is. Full Auto Friday, episode 30, Evan Haver and Trevor Thompson. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. For like two in a row, I wore that Mac V SOG sweatshirt and yeah. people were like where the fuck does that come from do you guys still sell those oh yeah yeah so there you go there's the answer people actually yeah. and there's a whoopee that's coming out right the tiger Strike yeah whoopee. No, we have that yeah we, no, i mean we that's have, out, out it's now. been out for and a while correct me if i'm wrong though the mac v sog all proceeds go to the dnc donations <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no no that's the frog skin, the frog skin. <laughs> this is gonna last so long <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's, this is just, like, I won't even be able to go to SHOT Show this without people going, hey, what's up? What's up, you crazy liberal? What's going on? <laughs> and for full disclosure, people, I don't give a fuck if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Be oh. a good person, and I don't give a fuck yeah, hey, what you like or believe. I cannot second that more, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it's not as if I, I check my friends to make sure that they're card-carrying GOP members before I, like, start talking to them and see if they're cool. I have no fucking clue where people stand politically most of the time. Do you know why I, I don't? Fuck. Because I don't ask them. Do you I know don't why? care. Because I don't give a fuck. Yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. care. Because it mostly doesn't Are you matter. cool? Do you like to do the shit that I like to do? Or do you, do you like to do shit that is cool that I don't like to do that maybe I want to learn about? Yeah. Because maybe I would want to do that in the future. Like yeah. falconry? Like I like, to exactly. row, I like to row really fucking big rivers. And guess what? There's some pretty crazy liberal people that like to do the same thing. No. Yeah. And no, river guys? A bunch of dope smoking no. river guys. They're they're pretty fun to Shocker. hang out with. Yeah. yeah, I bet they are. Yeah. All right. So now that everybody knows where they can get that damn sweatshirt. Yeah. The rules for Fallout Front. I started this. This is actually episode 30. What, what? Okay. Ooh. Which could be considered a mag dump, but we don't have time for that. Right. Because um, I get a volume of Q&A. So I, on Fridays, will pick... Somewhere between three to five. Okay. Random topics. Random. Limit myself to five minutes. Most of the time I go over. But it forces like an economy of thought. Yeah. And then you just try to hit all the different ones. So I picked four questions. I'll usually try to pick different categories. This first one will probably surprise you guys. He tried to screw me last time. This is not going to be... This is one that I've never been asked. But you guys were talking about this both last night and this morning. So I'm curious. So I'll read the question. Please. We go around. We have five minutes. We go to the next one. We'll get okay. you guys to the airport. Question number one comes from a guy named Matt. I appreciate your honesty and humility. Unless I have missed it, though, I have yet to hear you go into any detail about your preference when it comes to the arts. Could you talk about your favorite musicians and bands, both all time and maybe some recent discoveries? <clears throat> also, favorite films and directors, as well as any other mediums that strike your fancy. I feel like this may be another layer to you that myself and listeners would enjoy hearing about. It's definitely a revealing aspect of anyone's personality. Interesting. It is interesting. I've yeah. never once... I mean, I've been asked about music choices. And I'm, yeah. I mean, obviously, Metallica Ride the Lightning is an excellent on yeah. the helicopter right. song. Yeah. Um, anything in the tool spectrum. Yeah. Uh, just some fucking harder, heavier metal type stuff. Nine Inch Nails. Right. But that's not all about who I am. But, and yeah. I like this question because you guys were literally... This morning or we last were, night, you were, we were talking nerding about nerding the shit out on some art paintings. Yeah. So yeah, what speaks to you guys? Because I definitely listen to more than that type of music, um, especially as I've been away from that job. I actually right. ch- chill out quite a bit. Mm. But I'll finish. You get to go first, Mr. Hafer. Uh, so I went through phases with music. Obviously, I, I think everybody does. But so when I was working overseas, I listened to a lot of. Five Finger Death Punch, a lot of Tool. FFDP, if you yeah. want. <laughs> uh, a lot of Tool. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember 
a distinct story that I, I love to tell people is like there's nothing like flying down route Irish at about two o'clock in the morning going 100 miles an hour under MBGs listening to fucking Tool in a seven series armored BMW. And or being on the skids of a little bird, <laughs> yeah, flying so low that you're setting off car alarms while listening to that with it stuffed up underneath your peltors. There's, there's, <laughs> there's different pieces of my life where where music reminds me of that. Uh, so if I'm in the gym, I listen to things that are really heavy. I, I, I I'm recently going through a new or coming back to Pantera for the gym. So oh, that's what I've been doing. Some, a lot of Pantera. Some Cowboys from Hell. Yeah. Oh, fuck. It's oh, so good. Yeah. I've never so gotten into Pantera, but I have to check this out. Oh, it's good. God, I so used to listen to that before going jumping buildings. And uh, <laughs> That'd be appropriate for that, too. Yeah. <laughs> but now uh, I I listen to a lot. Uh, I listen to Vivaldi a lot. So I'm trying to actively... Some Four Seasons? release stress most of the time not increase not some the increase the P- yeah. internal PSI yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm trying to preserve my heart so I can see my daughters <laughs> graduate high school that would be pretty awesome uh, and most of the time now uh, uh, my my wife and I will have music on in the background when we're cooking and things like that it's like just standard acoustic guitars like it's it's like organic vegetables, white people shit. Like it's just like strung yeah. guitars or whatever. It, background, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. background music. I was more interested in this question. You were talking about the art work that oh, you're yeah. into. Yeah, that yeah, one was yeah. pretty fascinating. You were looking at a painting. Uh, was it Teddy Roosevelt? Winston Churchill. Not the same person no. at all. No. Yeah. Uh, so I was way off. <laughs> he's a uh, he's a fairly iconic uh, uh, person, I think. In 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 our, in just modern history, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people didn't realize that he was a painter. Uh, there was also MacArthur was a painter, Patton was a painter. A lot of these guys were legit painters. But Churchill did hundreds of paintings. And you can find them, uh, most of the time, believe it or not, they're in Britain. You can find them, and they're really, you know, some of them are really expensive, some of them are reasonable. Uh, so I've been trying to find a reasonably priced Winston Churchill, so I'll bid on them and try to find them, you know, for like 500 bucks, it seems to be my magic number <laughs> these days. <laughs> um, and I mean, then the guy that did the original cool. artwork for Rambo First Blood, the book, he has a series of paintings out there, and the guy is, I wish I could remember his name. So do you, you like the painting, like the Churchill painting, do you like how he represents it, or do you like the person who created it? Both. Okay. I, I think it's more about the person, uh, and I'm not saying that everything that Winston Churchill did is, you know, something we should admire. But I, he is the guy who is standing in front of Parliament, railing against the machine, against fascism, saying, "Wake the fuck up, people! This is going to be bad for everybody." Uh, and you know, he was proven right, and then ultimately the socialists voted him, voted him out uh, after they were done winning World War II. Collectively, obviously, we all did. Uh, but he's one of those guys in, in, in history that he's such an important figure to have that on my wall would be, that'd be huge. It would be huge. It would be just this, this really iconic piece of history that regardless of whether or not you're pro or con, I, I'm kind of in between, you know, like I think the guy is very interesting to read about. Um, you know, most of the time when I'm reading, I read a lot of Ernest Hemingway, um, I think I'm on my second full round of all his short stories, all his books. Uh, I just finished his uh, audio book on his biography uh, that the came, out from, <clears throat> came out from the CIA's former uh, museum court curator. Oh, no and, shit. Yeah, and it talks a lot about his involvement uh, with... Uh, the he was he was living in Cuba and then he went to Spain. This guy was fascinated. Like he was a fucking fascinated human. He fought in World War One. He fought in uh, in Spain. So he fought against uh, Franco in Spain. And then he fought in fucking World War Two. Yeah. He well, was a almost journalist. By no, he was a journalist. And his son was an OSS guy that was also shot. Was put into a POW camp. Like escape from the POW camp. The Hemingways are a fucking incredible piece of American savage. Yeah, he was a savage. He worked for what was uh, before the KGB. There was another uh, department over at the Soviet Union 
before World War II. So he had worked for them in the anti-fascist movement in a way not today's anti-fascist. These these guys were fighting like against, actual fascists, like real fucking like fascist dictators. authoritarian mm-hmm. yeah. fucking governments. And um, he was out fucking writing, but really what he was doing is he was carrying around little carbines and fucking taking it to people. He was using his journalism creds as for access. Yeah. The guy was fucking Good fascinating, work, man. Like he was fascinating. Uh, so. That's kind of the, the your, summary. Yeah. yeah. What a, I mean, you're Trevor, art, an artist at heart. I mean, you went to art school. Shit, last night at the dinner table, you were working on a, what would it be? A, a not piece. necessarily an abstract, but working on it. Is that going to be for a coffee bag, that artwork, or a t shirt? Yeah. Some, something. It'll yeah. appear somewhere in the BRCC. Yeah, it'll live somewhere. It'll live somewhere. At, at work, yeah. But, uh, and you've always been artistic, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I did a year of school at the. Chicago Art Institute, well, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the mm-hmm. big museum there. Um, I've always been, I don't, like we were talking about it at breakfast this morning. Like I like Remington, John Singer Sargent. Um, I always like Frazetta's illustrations. He's like a mid fifties, sixties pulp cover art type of uh, artist. He did a lot of fantasy stuff. He did Tarzan and um, work like that. Um, J.M. Turner, he's a British oil and watercolor painter Um, like it's for me it's like a palette and an emotion thing um i really like that kind those kinds of pieces of art Uh, and i really i deeply appreciate people like uh, mondrian klimt and uh picasso for their ability to break away from boundaries that were pre-existing like i i literally have the smallest amount of respect for people that are copying their shit now i think it's like totally intellectually lazy it's just total bullshit and and, yeah why like what are you doing the reason they were incredible is because they were fucking incredible right well i think it's easier for people to follow a path that's been etched already than or more it's more comfortable it's perhaps not easier than to try to break out on the whatever the reason and you know and that's part of why i left the school is I felt like the establishment was really pushing this lockstep approach of, you know, go do paint with your feelings, but it right. has to look like this. I'm like, you know, you can go fuck yourself. I'm, yeah. I'm out of here. Well, I hope people are ready now for my completely underwhelming answer and insight into how much of a fuck what I actually am. I don't know uh, the name of any artist that I really enjoy painting wise. <laughs> I like um, pictures of States of the United States of America, and I think you just said cock, which is true. You could hide one and the other, <laughs> layer them in. All over yeah. the place here. Graphic effect. No, I, I for whatever reason, I'm on a kick of pictures on metal, high resolution pictures on metal of all the different states that show the topographical relief. Right. And uh, I, I own zero of them, but I like to look at them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a single artist that I could point to and say in the painting world or the sketching world that, that I would know and say hey, this has been an inspiration for me and music wise I'm for most music for me is just background noise like I will throw on a random Pandora yeah. station to do the same thing to get a little bit of a churn and just let my brain spin off a little bit and it's the opposite of blood pressure enhancing right you know FFDP which I'm a huge fan of yeah. by the way but it's time and place I have, to, I have to throw one funny music story out there I used to listen to Rage Against the Machine oh yeah yeah um for two reasons one it's like on the heavy earth side Common. and because somebody was like you know that they they hate the government and they're like super count i'm like that's exactly why i'm listening to it overseas if they knew that i was listening to this to get ready to go out oh my god they would be so angry so so you two are cultured i'm basically uh, i would i'm an idiot <laughs> yeah. i would argue that point yeah all right so question two My father is a physician and recently he has drawn some unwanted attention to himself due to speaking at a city council meeting via a Zoom call. He, in blunt language, detailed why the city should not be thinking about mandating masks due to the ineffectiveness of the most common masks to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But that is not why I'm writing you. I need your advice on the repercussions of his stand against the narrative. He has gotten numerous death threats, most via internet, but a couple phone calls to his office. I am not afraid or paranoid, but I am being cautious in accompanying him when he goes shopping and checking in as much as possible. I unfortunately can't walk around gunned up due to the laws in my country. My questions to you are, how should one react to such events? Furthermore, how do you think people should gear up if they are about to say something controversial? Evan? (laughs) These questions were both timely and accurate for (laughs) you. 
Yours, I think, well, first off, you were drawn into a situation. It wasn't a stance that you took. But you certainly have uh, experienced some of the threat aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think anything in today's world can be misrepresented. Uh, and you have to be prepared for the fallout, right? Which is, unless you're going along, and, and that's the thing, is like, if you're going along a party line, whether it's left or whether it's right, you're going to be crucified anyway. Probably and by about 50% of the population. 50%. And then, you know, for the same thing in the middle, which is if you're not taking a stand on anything, that also sets you up for... Um, then you're everybody's enemy. Then you're everybody, right? So you're you're in the center. So for whatever reason, people feel like you have to have an opinion on something in today's day and age. You're required. Uh, you're required. Uh, and... I think that's part of the issue is that people, well, in this circumstance where he's actually a physician, he probably knows what he's fucking talking about and probably represent the facts. Well, really and let's be well. clear too, in the medical practice of which neither or none of us are in, I don't think there's a hundred percent compliance or agreements on any one no. topic. So just like you're saying, you're going to upset somebody on either side of the house, even inside of that community, just like all three of us. Um, served in the military, but there's no way that we have the exact same opinion on every single issue or topic. No, that's not true. We do. You know, we're all the same. Um, yeah, very, very homo homogenous. Yeah, brain, brain robots. Very homogenous. No, I, I think that you have to be prepared if you do have an opinion. You have to be prepared to essentially take the criticism, uh, and you know the the death threats and things like that. I think that's just a for me. Uh, I mean, I carry a Glock 43 every day. I mean, that's my everyday carry. That's what I carry in the appendix. So it's like, regardless, I'm prepared. But, you know, that's uh, that's also because we live in America. So it's easier for me. It's easier for me to protect my company, me, my family here. Overseas, it becomes a little bit more difficult. I think that it's probably more of just having a realistic look at just how humans interact and that violence can happen. So you have to be prepared. Doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, a tinfoil hat wearing. Paranoid. Paranoid. It just means that hey, you have to be prepared to react and you have to be at least proficient in defense in, of some kind with either a tool or non tool uh, in order to, to react to the situation. I know that's a general answer, but different physical capabilities will define what you're capable of ultimately. So if you can get in the gym and do jujitsu, that's great. But if you can't, then, you know, maybe you fucking carry a bat. I don't know. Well, and on that point, to yeah. really be proficient at jiu-jitsu, you're not talking about a few classes. You're talking right. about a few years to develop a baseline competency. So if people are in a place, let's say, where uh, purpose-driven tools are available and your choice is learn jiu-jitsu or get a tool, I'm here to tell you right now, if I only had one hour to work with somebody and I actually wanted to help prevent them from being in trouble when it comes to terms of a threat or the ability to defend mm -hmm. themselves, I have to go with the tool versus jujitsu yeah. with a compressed timeline. Yeah. Yep. However, jujitsu is a great long-term tool, but right. if I have limited time or you're a smaller person or a woman perhaps, I often think that the tool is a better place to start and then you layer on the other things on top of that. And directly answering his question is they're doing about the most they can do right now, which is when he goes somewhere that is high traffic, you're with them, you're increasing the eyes that are on the ground, just do the best you can do with the tools you have right now and try and acquire a way to get more legally and safely. And I would say to this person, you always have access to the authorities. If you think yeah. the death threats are legitimate, exercise every option you have in front of you. They seem to be situationally aware. Uh, and I agree with you, Evan. You know, if, if you're going to take a stand on something, which I think it's important that people do, just yeah. you should understand that people are going to react scrutinize what you say yeah. and that's an important thing to realize and also if you have a good idea or a legitimate idea it should be able to bear the weight of that scrutiny sure. if it falls apart under that scrutiny and it crumbles perhaps before you take a stand again uh reconsider why it is you believe what you believe and why you want to take a stand on it this is an interesting one slightly ties in a little bit a common theme in many of your episodes is getting good training and to find a jiu-jitsu gym. What is your recommendation for people like myself who live in rural areas with no gyms or training facilities remotely close? In my case, I live in a rural town in Wyoming 
The closest gym is hours away. Then when it comes to gun training, there's no there's a local gun club that has a very limited cowboy style shoots, which I don't actually know what that means, but not yeah. much beyond that. I have a base shooting ability, but have no idea where to go from there as far as the tactical shooting. Recommendations for people like myself? Well, I think you have to differentiate between the type of shooting that you're trying to do, right? So there's, I think there's a lot of different layers to that, which is yeah. what's, why, the what's, what's the end state, right? So if it's self-defense, yeah. that's not necessarily, it is tactical in somewhat, but it's not. It's not as complicated. It's reactive yeah. in that nature. So I think you have to set yourself up for success in a combination of ways, which is one, you have to be proficient in any tool, especially if you're bringing a tool to a fight, that tool can be turned on you in a, in a fucking moment. So, you know, for proper firearms training, there's a lot of different resources out there, uh, specifically on the internet, yeah. uh, the old internets. Which uh, if you're super rural and limited, that's also an option for jujitsu as well. You're gonna need right. a training partner, and I would say find somebody that's relatively your same age and size. Right. And you can dive down the internet rabbit hole. I mean, the Gracies have an amazing uh, online curriculum. I think you can go well through their belt structure. Wow. So it's possible. Right. I wouldn't say it's as optimal, but if you live in the middle of nowhere, yeah, like the internet's going to be your only research. It's going to be your only resource. Uh, Issue is there's some fuckwits on the internet. There is. So I think you have to go to guys, you know, like, you know, I think they our can, friends they are, can bear the weight a lot of, of scrutiny. friends out there. Like Glover Kyle, like would my be somebody yeah. to point somebody directly at. Yeah. Glover would be the guy that I would go to. Uh, and you, Kyle just said, Lamb. you just said the Gracies have a great online program for yep. jiu-jitsu. Their name is oftentimes associated with jujitsu. It's yeah. almost yeah. like they've been around it for a touch. Yeah, yeah. Henry and Huron uh, run that out of LA, and I haven't personally experienced it, but there are people who are in this exact situation that are doing the best they can to try to make themselves better, right. more capable of violence. Which, mm-hmm. spoiler alert, people doesn't mean you have to use the violence. I but th- I think it's a very important skill, especially for adult males to have, is yeah. to be capable of violence. You. I think you have to develop at least the proficiency to punch somebody. Like a punch is such a basic thing to acquire that skill in order to have the the actual fundamentals. Uh, you know, punching somebody is like and do it well. Yeah, and do like, it well. Like what's the, the I mean, Bru- a heavy bag isn't what, that expensive. What's the Bruce Lee quote? He's like, I'm not afraid of the man who knows a thousand kicks, but the man who's who has kicked so one, one kick, kick a thousand, thousand times. times. Like, yeah. yeah, that. So become proficient with a single tool. And I, I mean, I was going to say this, but take your time, do the steps in order for all of these things. I mean, none of it's magic. Mm-hmm. Like the only reason we can draw from the concealed quickly is purely based on repetition. Decades of practice. And you will yeah. fall to the lowest level right. of competency during a stressful situation, no matter what the skill that you're performing is from driving a car or a tractor to shooting a weapon. So... Take your time and do it the right way. Yeah, the internet is an amazing research. Yeah. Uh, research. Resource. Um, but you just have to be cautious. Yes. Yeah. And I, yeah, it's the, the amount of fuckery that goes on on the internet is unbelievable. But I think staying close to people who seem to be vetted, and by that I mean seem to be surrounded by other people from that community whose reputations are intact, probably a good right. starting point. All right, gentlemen, last question for today. This is a common one that I get. I'm curious to your guys' about, uh, thoughts on this. My question is similar to other career questions I've listened to, but I want a different perspective after speaking to my family about it. I work in the oil and gas industry. I have for 16 years now and have been very successful. I have kind of plateaued with my career and find it to be the average grind. I have a hard time keeping myself or keeping my interest at work and catch myself slacking from time to time. I began training jiu-jitsu last year and immediately fell in love with the art. One of my training partners at the gym is a lieutenant with the city police. Today we were talking about work and he suggested I apply for a position with the department. This intrigued me very much and I can't stop thinking about it. One regret I have after getting older is I wish I would have spent some time in the military but missed my opportunity as I am too old to join now. A couple of questions arise from the situation, but my main one is, am I too old to make a complete career change to becoming an LEO. I get this one all the time. People are in their mid to late 30s. Right. I wish I would have joined. I think about joining all the time. Is it too late for me? So established career, and I'll have people reach out from like Fortune 50 companies. Right. Like I'm killing it financially. I couldn't be more unhappy. Yeah. I want to join the military and be a special operations soldier. I'm in my 
you know, the waning years of my third decade. Right. Is it too late? So thoughts on a career change later in life into something totally new. I'm going to add Mill and mm-hmm. Elio. We can combine both of those because this guy might be a touch old, but others aren't. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Or, I, or in addition, what are your thoughts on or advice to people so they can put that rock down at some point in their life and not have it weigh on them all the time? I, I guess I'd have a question, which is, are you doing? Are you making a change in your career, or your life, and choosing one of public service based on your own ego and desires, or is that a job that you actually want and you want to perform the service? I would have to make. Like, like, I have to make an assumption based off the emails I get. I think most people who reach out have felt a call or desire to serve, but other opportunities presented themselves earlier in life and they pursued that and made a career of it. And but I they ass- can't not they can't kick that desire. I assume so too, but I you you so just let's take have it, to ask. Well yourself. let's take it from that angle. Yeah. So our answers will be prefaced off of that. Okay. Somebody who yeah. felt that they needed they need to or do wanted it. to serve but now they are okay. much later in life. Then answer the question, do you think you'll be an asset to that community? I don't know. It's, I mean, thirty-eight starting off as an off as a officer or even beginning the special operations. Precisely, plan. that's what I'm yeah. thinking. Like, are do do you think you will be you will be an asset? Because I mean, we had a couple guys in my buds class that were in their there was early a guy in my 30s. class who was thirty-six. He was thirty-two from a. He had a hard fucking time physically. Yes, but can you imagine those? Uh, a guy. Let's say this guy's talking about Leo. Thirty-eight years of life experience under his belt and all of the things that he's had to deal with and then he's interfacing. I always think about uh, law enforcement questions. I always yeah. think about my kids. Who would I want as an officer to be interfacing right. with my kids on their worst day? Right. I want a guy with a lot of life experience right. who understands human behavior. So I think there's a huge aspect there. Yeah. But he's also very... You're old in the tooth in comparison yeah. to somebody who might be almost two decades into that career field. So from a yeah. physical aspect, I mean, there's a balance for sure. I, I think that people that have a, a, a that doubt, right, and they keep coming back to it and they keep circling back to it, they have to find a way to eliminate that doubt. So you have to either come to terms with it, right, which sounds pretty obvious. You have to either come to terms with it, put it behind you. And which I feel like easier said than done, yeah, probably. It is, but the way you put it to bed is, I think this, is you do it. Because you're always going to have that doubt, and if that's going to gnaw and eat at you and it's going to continue to... You know, the, the, the clock can't that, If stop. that keeps you up at night. Yeah, if that keeps you up at night, you just have to go do it. And you have to try. So if it's a special operations pipeline, if it's LEO, if it's fire, whatever it might be, uh, there's an individual desire to serve the community or serve the community in a professional capacity, whatever that might be. You have to fucking get that out of your mind. And so if you try and fail, at least you know. Yeah. You know. And you'll be able to put that to bed, go back to your job, and I think it makes people, it, it, it completes or makes them whole. So I got it, I, I mean, tried. Step one would be talk to a, a recruiter for any of those programs. Well, and, use and anything and a recruiter says with caution. No, 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 I mean, personal experience. I'm, talking, I'm talking about for those specific programs. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, I'm considering this, but this is my age and X, Y, Z. Well, and understand the wager, too, because if you right. do go in and try it and you're unsuccessful, you're going to owe Uncle Sam a few years. Right. So you may not be able to get right back to your job. So understand that gamble. Yeah. And another thing I would say is understand that in that gamble as well as you might make it through and it might be the most unfulfilling career path Correct. ever that you've ever had. And it'll be nothing like you thought it was. And you might have grown up watching or reading fucking books about Zero Dark Thirty and all of this shit. And you get in at a time period where there's a lull. And you're going to be still unsatisfied. And where does that leave you? It still leaves you being able to, to uh, check the box and say that you did For it sure. and put it behind you. Yeah. yeah. I know so many guys that that was their thing, right? They joined maybe in their 20s or early 30s. Uh, they had a job or a profession even. You know, there were a lot of guys that I knew that were working, you know, New York, yeah. you know, on Wall Street, 9-11 happened. They're like, fuck this, I'm going to war. And uh, they did four or six years whatever it might be and then they went back to their previous profession or they didn't go back to their previous profession but i think if you if you live your life without checking off all your boxes when you get to be too old like truly too old that will continue to eat you up and if that's going to eat you up to the point where the last minute of life you have left you're going to be thinking about that you got to fucking take that out you, yeah you got to take it down i agree trevor anything else to add 
Yeah. I agree with Evan. Like, if if you think that that's going to eat at you when you're 45 and literally legally too old to do so many of these jobs that, you know, you're describing people are asking about doing, Mm -hmm. have a hard look at yourself. And I was thinking about this. I don't have a family, but if some of these people have families, they need to discuss this with their families if they have people that are relying on them. If you have a wife and kids or if you have a husband and kids and you're wanting to make this choice and they rely you are the primary caregiver and income earner for sure you can't make that decision you need to fucking talk that over because that is not on them yeah that's not an impulse purchase because all buying a pack of gum at the grocery because like you joined the navy when you were young yeah i I was 19 yeah i was making decisions that only yeah yeah, you were 18 so like cascading decisions around my family but there was nobody relying on me for anything I, i mean I could have been a popcorn salesman at a circus and it wouldn't have impacted anybody any different, you know, yeah. like financially. Right. That's all I got. You guys ready to go to the airport? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's how you do a full out of Friday. I love it. All right, Thanks, done. Man. Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? Full out of Friday number 30, which I guess could have been a mag dump or something special, but, well, actually, it was something special. I had two friends in town, Evan Hafer and Trevor Thompson, who will also be featured on Monday's episode. Now, I don't know what the hell is going on in the studio, but for the first time ever, all three of the cards from the video cameras were corrupted. So if you're a YouTube fan, I'm sorry to tell you, you're just going to look at a picture of us, three handsome devils. Because essentially, the audio is the only thing that survived. I don't know. The uh, video and audio from the episode on Monday, it's all perfect. I I have no idea. So the learning continues, but, you know, I guess that's the way that it is. Full Auto Friday, episode 30, Evan Haver and Trevor Thompson. Enjoy.